Welcome to each and every one of you. My name is Paul André Durache. I'm the Archbishop of Gatineau, and this is a series entitled Advent Readings, where I present and comment on the texts that are proposed by the liturgy for the weekday Masses and Sunday Masses during this Advent season. Today we're looking at the texts for December uh, 10th, Thursday, the Thursday of the second week of um, Advent. As those who've been following this series since the beginning, uh, as you know, most of these days we've been looking at a first text that is from Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, and then we're, we see a text where the Gospel writers show Jesus fulfilling the prophecies of Isaiah. Today, the gospel texts, and for the next few days, will be different. They're going to present to us how Jesus views John the Baptist. So we'll come back to that, but we're going to continue reading texts from Isaiah as the first reading. They won't necessarily connect so clearly with the gospels. Um, today, we're looking at uh, an excerpt from Isaiah 41, verses 13 to 20. So those of you who saw my commentary for Sunday's readings know that chapter 40 is kind of a, a dividing point in the book of Isaiah. 1 to 39 was written around 750 BC, and uh, then 40 and afterwards were written 150 to 200 years later. They deal more with uh, the exile of the Jewish uh, leaders and population to Babylon and the return from exile. And the focus is on God intervening to transform the horrible situation in which the, the Jewish population finds itself to restore Israel, to restore Jerusalem. This is what God is going to do. And so we continue here is um, this, this text that we are looking is, at, is divided into two sections. So the first section uses one metaphor, one symbol, and the second section uses another. So let's look at the first one. Thus says the Lord, I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. The, the prophet here is addressing the people, but the prophet wants the people to understand that he's not talking in his own voice. It's not the prophet who's saying, do not be afraid. It is God. The, the prophet has discerned that this, this is God's message. So the way of doing that is he takes God's own voice and speaks with God's words. I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. And it goes on, do not fear, you worm, Jacob, you insect, Israel. Now, th these words can be seen as quite derogatory, practically insulting. They, they can also be understood as affectionate, you, you poor little worm, Jacob, you dear little insect, Israel. You're so weak, you're practically nothing, but I am going to I'm going to come to you. So, so it really indicates the huge distance between God and creation. Um, and at the same time, it's an indication of the, the poor situation in which Israel finds itself. It really brought low through the, the conquest of Jerusalem and of, is, of Israel by the Babylonians and this exile. They've really been brought low. They are diminished. They feel that they are nothing. And so God says, do not fear, you worm, Jacob, you insect, Israel. I will help you, says the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Now, the Redeemer, the one who intervened to help someone, was generally a family member. So God is saying, you might be a worm, you might be an insect, but you're of my family. In a sense, you might be a worm, but you're my worm. You might be an insect, but you're my insect. I'm going to take care of you. So in here, there's a real sense of relationship and of God saying, it's because of my relationship for you, because of my love for you, that I'm going to act. And here is uh, the, the powerful metaphor that he uses. Maybe you might be an insect, a worm, but I'm going to make of you a threshing sledge, sharp, new, and having teeth. Uh, a threshing sledge was... Um, was an instrument that was tied to the yoke of oxen as they were 
crossing a field, this threshing sledge, which was weighted down, would have teeth that would dig into the earth and break up clumps of earth and break up, uh, you know, uh, what was left of dead roots and everything. It really tore at the surface of the earth in order to open up so that seed could fall into it and, and bear fruit. So he's saying to Israel, I'm going to make of you a threshing sledge, sharp, new, so so this is this is a new reality and having teeth and uh, you can imagine the kind of teeth and you shall thresh mountains uh, the 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 image here is that this this threshing sledge is practically cosmic in size and you're going to be able to thresh mountains not just little clumps of clay in the field but mountains and crush them and you will make the hills like chaff and you will winnow them and the wind shall carry them away who is the them? Well, implied here, it is the, the, the Babylonians. It, it's these people who've conquered them and have uh, crushed them. They will now be crushed. And Israel will have will be the, the, the threshing uh, machine here. Uh, Israel will be the tool that God uses. And the point here that God makes in the next sentence is that, understand this, Israel, I am the one who's acting here. And so the glory does not come to you. The glory comes to me. So then you shall rejoice in the Lord, in the Holy One of Israel. You shall glory. So don't get proud about what I'm doing. Don't think this depends on you. Huh? This, is, this is my work. I'm doing this work for you on your behalf because I love you and I care for you. But never forget that I'm the one that's doing it. The second part of the text that we're reading today moves to another image. It's more universal in nature. It doesn't seem to address itself just to Israel. Uh, it, let's listen to the beginning. When the poor and the needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. So it is the same God who's acting, always the God of Israel. Uh, but here it seems to be broader in scope. All those who are poor and needy, God will bow down and care for them. And so the imagery he uses here is moves from an imagery of this threshing machine that is an image practically of violence. Here it is, it is an image of renewal. And uh, those of you who've been following um, these presentations will recognize the creation imagery that uh, Isaiah often uses. I will open rivers in the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. Remember, he's, he's speaking to those who are needy and seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst. So he's saying, I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. So Again, we see the situation of scarcity, of poverty, bare heights, deep valleys, wilderness, uh, dry land. And what is he going, what is God going to put there? Uh, open rivers, fountains, pools of water, springs of water. And I will put in the wilderness, and the wilderness, you know, for me, having grown up in northern Ontario, the wilderness is, is woods, plenty of woods and lakes. But I have to put myself back into the situation in Jerusalem where the wilderness is basically desert. Nothing is growing in the wilderness. And so God says, I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olives. I will set in, a, in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together so that all may see and know. See here the universal aspect of it? God, th this imagery of vegetation in the dry land is an imagery that speaks of abundance coming to the needy and the poor. And the universality of this message and the care of God 
results in a universal acknowledgement so that all may see and know, all may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. And again, I remind you that the Lord is shorthand for Yahweh, which is the, the, the proper God of Israel, that it is the God of Israel who cares for the poor in all lands. The, the God of Israel is the God of all peoples, is what Isaiah is hinting at here, that it is the Lord that has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. And so we see here, you know, right at the beginning of the Bible story, in the 12th chapter of Genesis, when God promises to give a descendant to Abraham, he, he says, your descendants, all nations will be blessed in your descendants. Here it is, all nations that are blessed by the God of Israel, who Isaiah will eventually recognize as the only God. But the renewal that is promised to Jerusalem is not just for Jerusalem. It's for the whole world. This is what is growing, you could say, as in the consciousness of Isaiah and in the consciousness of Israel itself and certainly in the consciousness of the early church that the good news of Jesus is not just for Israel. It is addressed first of all to Israel, but through Israel to the whole world so that a restored Israel becomes a blessing for the whole world. So let's move on to Matthew 11, uh, chapter 11, verses 11 to 15. So in the Gospels we're going to be reading in the next days, we're going to uh, look at passages where Jesus talks about John the Baptist. We're going to see how Jesus sees John the Baptist. Uh, so this really gives us an insight into the role of John the Baptist, into his mission in the story of the development of the good news and also of the fulfillment of the prophecies of Isaiah and the other visionaries of Israel. So uh, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, this story comes to the end, at the end of a a long story uh, of a long discourse of Jesus where he's speaking about what it means to be his disciples and what it means to take up his uh, teachings. Uh, he went on to teach and proclaim his message in the surrounding cities and towns. Now, the, these, this passage, these chapters are going in Matthew are going to show the enmity, the resistance to Jesus's message from particularly the religious leaders of Israel. So that resistance and that persecution that is being kind of uh, foreshadowed here of Jesus is the context in which Jesus speaks about John the Baptist, and we shouldn't forget that. So speaking to the crowds about John the Baptist, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So what, what is he saying here? That of all human beings, all those born of women, of all human beings up to now, no one is greater than John the Baptist. That's quite the statement. Jesus is really putting John the Baptist, you could say, on a pedestal. And yet, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What, what does Jesus mean by this? Um, I think what we can understand is this, that the, the kingdom of heaven is truly, Jesus starts preaching about it. He starts announcing his presence there. But the kingdom of heaven really you could say, it is loosed upon the world with the resurrection of Jesus. This is where the, the restoration that Isaiah had foreseen, this is the beginning of the true restoration when death itself is conquered in the resurrection of Jesus. John the Baptist will not see this. The apostles who are with Jesus, they see this and they become witnesses to this. So uh, in Matthew, you could say there's a, a, a three-step uh, development. There, there's the Old Testament that prophesies, that speaks of these days where God will restore Israel in the world. They foreshadow it. And then there's the coming of Jesus. When Jesus starts speaking about this, teaching about this kingdom, giving signs of its breaking, its inbreaking into the world. And John the Baptist is part 
of the Jesus story. So he's greater than all those who came before. As a matter of fact, we have to remember that there has been no prophetic voice recognized in Israel for a few hundred years. Malachi was the last prophet until John the Baptist came. So this is this in itself is remarkable that people recognize John the Baptist as a prophet and Jesus saying he's he's the greatest of the prophets because he's part of my story. But he will die before Jesus' own resurrection, before the you know the kingdom of God breaks forth into the world through the power of the resurrection. John the Baptist will not see that. And so this is why he's saying. Uh, no, of those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Not because they're more special, but because they are blessed in a special way to be living in these times. From the days of John the Baptist until now, so from the moment of John the Baptist's apparition on the scene until this moment when Jesus is speaking to them, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. What Jesus is referring to is the resistance. There is resistance to John the Baptist. As Jesus is speaking, John the Baptist is in the, 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 the jail of King Herod and he will soon be beheaded. So John the Baptist has known this violence. He's proclaiming the gospel, but there is a violent resistance to that. Jesus sees this violence, this resistance being turned against him also. So from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. They resist it. They try to stop the kingdom from from being being spoken about even from being manifested huh? for all the prophets and the law prophesied jesus is speaking about the past prophets all the prophets and the law prophesied until john came and if you are willing to accept it he is elijah who is to come let anyone with ears listen what is Jesus saying here? The prophet Malachi, the last of the prophets, had, had prophesied that Elijah would return in order to announce the coming of the Messiah. And Elijah, if you know the story of Elijah, Elijah was one of the first prophets. And Elijah, in the story of Elijah, he does not die. He's taken up into heaven on a fiery chariot. And so people say he didn't die. It means he's still alive. He's not in Sheol. He's not in the place of the dead. He's with God, and God is holding him, Malachi says, until it is the time for the Messiah to come. And Elijah will return, and he will prepare uh, the people for the coming of the Messiah. Jesus is saying, this is John the Baptist. The stories we tell about uh, Elijah, John the Baptist is fulfilling them. If you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come to proclaim the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus ultimately is saying, and I then am the Messiah. And let anyone with ears to hear listen. So we see how John the Baptist has an important role. He himself is fulfilling prophecies from the Old Testament. He himself is part of the story of Jesus, part of the coming of the kingdom. This is why it is so important that we listen to stories of John the Baptist in, that, in this Advent season, because as I've explained earlier, we're not just preparing Christmas the day of uh, the birth of Jesus. We're preparing to celebrate the Christmas season, which is the inauguration of the fulfillment uh, of the scriptures, the beginning of the kingdom of God. And this really starts when Jesus starts proclaiming after the baptism with John the Baptist. So the Christmas season, which extends from Christmas Day until the feast of the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist, where, is a time where we're celebrating the inauguration of the kingdom of heaven among us. This is what we're celebrating in Jesus Christ. John the Baptist has an important role to play with this. And so this is why in these days, just before the Christmas season, we focus on John the Baptist. Um, what is the message for us then? Well, the message really is that God is acting through Jesus in order to transform 
us to transform the world's situation. And we are called to collaborate with him on this mission. It is always a message of hope, but it is also a message, a message inviting us to engage, to involve ourselves in this ongoing transformation of the world. This is what the good news is about. God is acting in the world. He acts through his people who we form the body of Jesus Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We continue his mission in the midst of the world. So it is a, a kind of a wake-up call for all of us. This is what Advent is all about. And with this thought, I bless you and we'll see you tomorrow.